I'm going to start today's class with saying something that you're probably not going to believe. You ready for this? This is an interesting example. Again, this is what math is. Math is not memorizing rules. Math is not doing things because they work, whatever that means, or, or following procedures because teachers told us to. Math is about finding truths that have to be truths, whether you believe them or not. And I'm going to show you my favorite example of that. This is what today is about. I claim that you can draw any four dots on your page. Any four dots, okay? Take it, take a moment, go to the back page of your packet, any four dots you want, here you go. Uh, I'm gonna put a dot here, I'm gonna put a dot here, I'm gonna do another dot maybe right up here, and another dot right up here. Now connect them all so that you have some kind of some kind of figure. You Go to the middles of each of the dots, you ready? Okay, so here we go, I'm gonna find the middles. If you connect these dots together in such a way that they're they're making actually a shape, something that actually has an outer shape, if you do this, I claim this has to be a parallelogram. Has to be. In other words, the two lines that you have that are opposite, like this line right here and this line right here, have to be parallel. These two opposite lines right here, they have to be parallel. That's going to work for every single time you do it. It doesn't matter what you start with. Try it, try it out, try it with another one. Do it, do it, what, what happens if I have these four dots? What happens if I connect it and I make some kind of V shape? Does that work? What kind of, what if I do it for a box? Does a box work? Can I connect four shapes like that? What if I just start with the lines? Can I do it with four lines like this so long as I connect them at the very end? Does it work? Does it actually work? That, that's, that's, that's wild, that's madness, that's a conspiracy. How does that possibly, possibly work every time? Every single time you have no choice but to draw me a parallelogram when you connect those middles. Has to happen. That's what today's lesson is going to be about. Now the first thing, the first thing for me to be able to claim that, notice that there's a couple of different things. I'm not saying it looks like a parallelogram. I'm saying it is one. That's a difference. What does that actually mean? That means that it doesn't look like these two lines are going in the same direction. It doesn't just look like these go in the same direction. I'm saying they go in the same direction. So I have to find a way to prove that. We're going to find a way to prove that. And that doesn't mean that, that these look like they go in the same direction. They do go in the same direction. I have to find a way to prove that. We're gonna do that together today. We're talking about parallel lines. What does it mean to be parallel? Now we know the idea of parallels. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I forgot to get rid of this on mine. Write down the theorem found in, no, we're gonna prove the theorem, we're gonna prove things. Here's what I'm thinking. Parallel, what does parallel mean? I'll start with a picture, there we go. These are parallel. Why are they parallel? So, got an idea, let's go with the why. Why are they parallel? They're parallel because they'll never cross. Some of you may say that. They're parallel because they go in the same direction. Some others might say that. How do, how, how do I know? How, what, does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? Okay, I could write a sentence. Uh, parallel means if same direction. Uh, I could also say uh, parallel if don't cross. Okay, that's another way of changing your perspective. Um, parallel if I can pick one up, move it, shift it, relocate it, place it down without changing the orientation. Oh, okay, so like parallel if same orientation. I guess that's what direction means. Okay, orientation, orientation. So if they're the same direction, then they're parallel. What does that mean? What well, we talked about last time, being able to capture this idea of direction, especially when we're no longer talking about lines as just being things that I draw, but things that I graph when I put them on a Cartesian coordinate plane. In other words, a coordinate plane that was discovered by Rene Descartes, a Cartesian coordinate plane. In fact, the idea of it being a coordinate plane, think about what that is, coordinate plane, means that I have order, ordinates, I have two orders, or I have order and it's co, it's two, two orders, two orders or two double ordered or double organized or double named thing. That's why I always am naming things in terms of an X and a Y. It's a coordinate plane. I need to know not only the X, but also the Y. Okay, so graphing things on this coordinate plane allows me to find that orientation. It allows me to find that direction. It may help me with determining whether or not two lines are parallel. 
What would they be if they were parallel? Well, we talk about them having the same direction. How do we talk about them being the same direction in a graph like this? Well, if you remember from last time, we were talking about it in terms of its slope, where its slope was this kind of connection, this, this relationship between its rise, its change in Y, and sometimes I might write that using the mathematical symbols. We use delta. A delta means a change. Delta is a Greek letter, and so it means delta Y. But all that delta means, so this is a letter, it's like thinking of it as a letter D, but a Greek letter D. It just means that I'm looking for the difference in two Y values, any two Y values that are on this line. And that if I wanted to then compare that to my change in X, that would be this right here. And my change in X is just the difference between my two x values, an x2 minus an x1, and I could look at the difference between those, and I could do that ratio, and that's gonna tell me my rise to my run. So you could think of it as rise and run, however you wanna organize this. Okay, so we have the idea of slope as being that. Well, if this has a certain slope, let's call it m, because all of this really is just usually titled with a letter m, we could say that this M, this slope for the top line has to be the same thing as the slope for the bottom line. And it doesn't matter which two points I choose on it, because as long as the ratio is the same, that just means that my changing from one point to another point on that line has to get me that same direction. Okay, so parallel could be thought of as having the same slope. Interesting. Let's use that. So let's see if we can show that these two lines are in fact parallel. Now, first, Notice the bold claim that we're doing. We're trying to answer a question of geometry using algebra. Using algebra, right? These are equations that just simply say there might be an X and there might be a Y that makes this true. In fact, there might be a few of them. There might be an infinite number of them that make this true. There might be some X's and Y's that make this true. We're taking our mathematical brain and saying, on top of the, the idea that there could be solutions to this, I could draw the solutions. I could change my perspective into a picture and I could use the picture to show that these both represent parallel lines. And we're gonna say that that actually has even more impact than, than just, just what we're saying on the surface level. We can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. All right, so let's play. Um, first, what is this, this form? We've seen this form. It's a very common form of a line. It's called the slope intercept form. If you remember from last time, it follows the structure of y equals mx plus b. And there's a lot going on here. We'll break it down again. Y is any y value, any height, any height along my coordinate plane. M is a number that talks about my slope. This could be a decimal. This could be a crazy irrational number. Most often it usually looks like a fraction because it's talking about a ratio between steps and steps, but it could be really anything. And all it's talking about is how much more am I going up compared to how much am I going sideways? This B here, this is a starting point. This is a starting point for my Y value. And so this is what we would call our Y intercept. So you can add that in there. So I've got my Y intercept. I have my slope. I have my height at any given point. So you could say uh, height, um, and you can even say like a point height. And this would be the same points uh, vertical dis or horizontal distance. So points uh, horizontal, just like that. Now think about again what this actually means. If we wanted to step away from the idea of it being a picture, step away from the definitions, really interpret the meaning. What does this say? Um, this says that if I'm able to change X and I'm able to change Y, then where do I start from? Maybe I'll start from my X value of zero. If X is zero, then zero times M would be nothing. And so if I'm starting at X equals zero, then I'm just going to add B to zero, which gets me B. And that means that Y starts at B when X is zero. That's exactly what we would want an intercept to be thinking of. We could say that if instead my Y value is zero, that would be what's the height over here on the left. If the height on the left is equal to zero, then there'd be a certain number of steps sideways I would have to take so that I had enough of those slopes make it take effect so that I would be able to come down from this intercept. So you can put a storyline behind this. For our purposes, I hope we'll put an E here. For our purposes, we're gonna use it to just kind of pull out some information that's important up here. So up here, what do we have? The slope is two over three. And what that means is that every time I go up by two steps, whatever two steps means, to 10 big steps, to half steps, to anything steps. So that means I have a ratio of saying I go up two steps, whatever a step is, 
And every time I do, I'm going to go over three steps. Okay, so this is my ratio, two to three. That's my first direction that I'm going up and to the right, because that would be up, and then to the right would be both positive up and positive sideways distances. Good, I've got my slope. What about this equation here? This equation isn't as easy to determine what the slope is. It is linear. It's linear because I have a number times a variable plus numbers times variables equals numbers. I got nothing but numbers and numbers times variables. So, okay, so it is a line. How could we make it look like something that has slope in it? Um, well, recall that we either have this equation, with, which works very, very nicely, or we also have the point slope form, which is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Sometimes we can organize lines into this structure, and this would allow us to determine what the equation of a line is using any point. I don't have a point. I don't think that's going to be very helpful for right now. So that was kind of a nice idea. We'll cross it off. Maybe I just need to instead take my equation and convert it again into this slope intercept form. Okay, so let's play. I've got 4x plus 6y equals 12. And I would like to make it look like this structure right here. Maybe I don't know what to do first. Um, what does it look like? What does it look like? It looks like I have y on one side and that's it. Oh, so maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe I just need to start with trying to get y alone on one side. Okay, so what's keeping y from being alone? The 4x for sure. Uh, I can do the opposite of a positive 4x to both sides. That would be subtracting 4x. Uh, that would get me a cancellation on the left and leave me with 6y on the left. On the right-hand side, I would have that as 12 minus 4x. That looks really, really good. All right, uh, what else can I do? Um, I could then try to get y alone by dividing the 6. So I'll make a little arrow to myself here. I'll divide both sides by 6. That's going to be y equals uh, 12 minus 4x over 6. So I'm dividing everything by 6 on the right-hand side. Okay, well, that's fine. I'll just divide everything by 6. So that'll be y equals um, 12 over 6 minus 4 over 6. I could even put the x on the top. I could pull it out here. Both of those would be the same. Um, and you can always check yourself, right? Did I do that right? Well, could I add fractions by just adding the top and the numerator and keeping the denominator the same? Yep, that's true. Can I multiply fractions times variables by just putting variables on the top? Yep, that's true. So I can do it in reverse as well. What does that leave me with? That leaves me with y equals 2. I'll put an arrow here. y equals 2 minus, uh, I could simplify this a little bit, 2 thirds x it almost looks like my structure. My structure up here has the mx plus b. It has the number and x to go first. So I guess if I really wanted to look quite, quite proper, or I could look at this as y equals, and then I'll put the whole number attached to x in the front. That would be a negative two thirds, because the negative is part of that two thirds. It's the opposite of two thirds of an x. And then I have plus two. Okay, so here we have the other equation. I have equation one, I have equation two. Do they have the same direction? Um, let's see, do they have the same direction? Or did I make a typo? I might have made a typo. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I don't think they do have the same direction. I think they should have. I think this should have been a negative two-thirds. If this was a negative two-thirds, they would have had the same direction. I think I have a typo. I'll fix it before you all get at it. Okay, let's assume that this was a negative two-thirds. And so I was going down two steps, and I was going over to the right three steps for my first line. For my second line, I'm doing the exact same thing because I've got that same direction. Okay, if we wanted to tie this back into a picture, we absolutely could. Let's put this into a picture and see what would be happening between these two different lines. All right, so assuming that I didn't have a typo originally, let's make this where, um, okay, let's try to graph the first equation, this equation right up here. That says that I start at an intercept of one, a y-intercept of one, so I'll put a plot right there, and then I go over three steps, one, two, three, I go over three steps every time I go down two. So I'm gonna go down two and over three. One, two, three, and then down two. One and two would put me right about here. That'd be another point on the line. And so long as I have two lines, I, or two dots on my line, I can connect them all. That's nice, good. Let's now look down here at my second equation. This one says that I started a y-intercept of two. And again, I go down two, so I go down two every time I go over three. One, two, three, that puts my next dot here, and I'm gonna connect them all with a drawing. All right, based on my loose, loose sketch that I'm doing here, that looks like, yeah, it is parallel. I've just shifted everything up a little bit, and we can again see that in the equation. Here I had plus one, here I had plus two. I just shifted it up a little bit by adding a bit to it. 
all right, everything's making sense. So we can capture the idea of parallel just by using uh, the definitions that we've come up with, the ideas, the models we had before. And I didn't have to say it's because it looks the same. I didn't have to say it was because I think it's the same. It's because it's the same. And this is, again, a very interesting difference between mathematics and science. In science, you say that the sun rises every day because I see the sun rising. And then you say, okay, well, what if you're blind? And you'd say, I, I can feel the sun rising. You say, okay, what if you didn't have your senses? How would you know? And you'd go, I don't. Science relies on our senses. We have to perceive the world, interpret our perception. And that means that at any given point, if we perceive it wrong, we take wrong data or wrong collections, we're wrong. What's up? Oh, okay. Sorry, you're kind of... <laughs> A few moments later. Hey there, how's it going? I just literally had somebody walk up to my, my window and knock on it, which scared the living bejesus out of me. So, whew. all right, so we've talked about parallel lines here. What about perpendicular? Is there a similar thing we can do for perpendicular lines? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's play a little bit here. What can we do with perpendicular lines? Uh, what do perpendicular lines look like? Uh, they look like lines that go in opposite directions. Let's draw that. All right, um, these are perpendicular lines. How do I know that? Well, one goes up, one goes sideways. You can't go up enough to go sideways and you can't go sideways enough to go up. So yes, those are perpendicular. They have, they're in opposite directions from each other uh, completely because if they were in any way similar, then doing one would be similar to doing the other. And I can't go sideways enough to go up. I can't go up enough to go sideways and similar with going down and to the left. Okay, so that, that's one way of doing perpendicular lines. How would I know about lines like this? Well, I could say there's a 90 degree angle between them, um, but then I have to prove that, I have to measure that. What if I don't know that? What if I just see them? I stumble across them, I'm thinking. Hmm. What about their direction? What about their slope? Okay, this one's going to go over and up. This one's going to go down and over. Uh, yeah, which I guess is just over and up again. I'll tell you a really interesting way to think about this, and I'll see if I can do it with the, with the drawings that I have already. All right, so imagine I took this picture. This one I know is perpendicular. If I rotated it a little bit, I could get it to look like the other one, couldn't I? If this other one was in fact perpendicular, then I should be able to rotate this one enough that I get it to match up perfectly. So what that means is that if I shift it over a little bit, I've sacrificed for this top line, this line up here, it used to be going up and down. It used to be going up and down where it was going up and now I've made it go sideways a little bit. So I've kind of given up some of the sideways or given up some of the up to make it go sideways. Here, it was going perfectly sideways. Now I've made it go down by the same amount. If it wasn't the same amount, I wouldn't have been able to keep them connected. So, okay, well that used to be, the first slope used to just be a vertical slope. If you remember, a vertical slope is an undefined slope. Okay, that was true. And then I had a, a second slope. Uh, my second slope was, was a horizontal slope. That was a slope of zero. Okay. Then I rotated a little bit. So now we'll take, and take uh, this is scenario one. We'll do scenario two. Scenario two said, I now have a slope that goes up and to the right. So I have a positive amount. I have a positive slope. And then the positive slope, has me going up a bunch and then over a little bit. So positive slope has me going up. That's the positive part. I have up, uh, I'll say I go up a certain amount, a lot amount, and I go over a little bit. All right, over a little. So I'll say I go up a bunch and I go over, which is positive, uh, a little. Okay, that makes sense why my fraction would be positive. Then I have a positive number over a positive number. Good. What about M2? M2, which would be this now down here. This is where I was going I'm now going down a little bit, right? Cause I gave up some of the, I rotated a little bit. Now it's going down a little bit. So I've got um, down a little bit, which is a negative number. So I've gone down a little bit over, um, it's still going over to the right uh, a lot. It's over to the right a lot. So over a lot. Okay, okay, that, sound, that, that, that seems good. In fact, we said these are actually connected. It's like this number up here, the amount that it was going up before, uh, if I give up some of that, I had to give up some of the over for this one. And if I gave up some of the over, if I gained some over for the other one, it's like I had to create some down in the other one. Oh, that's weird, let's play. Okay, um, play, play, play. So that means that I was here, 
I gave up some of my up in my up arrow to get some over. And in doing so, I created some down in my other arrow. So this, this over in my first arrow is connected to this down in my second arrow. They're the same. Let's use some variables then. Okay, so I have M1, I'll, I'll call this, uh, so the amount that I'm going over um, is the same as the amount that I'm going down in the other one. Let's call that, uh, I don't know, B maybe. Okay, so I've got, if I put some B in this, in this fraction, I have to put some B in the top fraction, but it's negative. I go negative, I go down. That's representing that I'm going down. Okay, great. And then if I put some A, some amount of, let's see, I was going up. How much was I going up? I was going up and now I'm going up less. And in doing so, I'm going over less and the same one as the other one, or at least I'm going over the same. That means that this, this number up here is the same number as this number right here. Okay, so I've got A and A. I think we've described what it means to be perpendicular. It means that whatever I'm going up in one, I am going over in the other. Let's take a look at that here. So it's like if I'm going up in one, which would be here, it's like I'm going over in the other right here. And if I'm going down in one, like I guess that would be right here, I'm going over that in the other. I've got this relationship where if I give up up in one, one of these arrows, I have to be going giving up some of the sideways in the other, or at the very least, if I'm giving gaining some sideways in the other, I have to be gaining some up in the other. Okay, so perpendicular lines. I think we've got enough now where we can make a claim about what it means to be a perpendicular line. Perpendicular lines are lines with slopes that are reciprocals. In other words, the fraction is flipped. It's like you've got the inverse of that fraction. You've got the flip of the fractions. You could say reciprocals or you could say inverses. But even more so than that, we have to capture the fact that it was a negative. There's a negative over here and there wasn't in the other one. So in fact, they're not only reciprocals, they're reciprocals that are negative. They are negative reciprocals. So here we are. Let's try to find an equation of a line that is perpendicular to this one. So first we'll graph it. Y equals five X plus two means I start at Y intercept of two, one, two, before I take any of my X steps. So I'm gonna take one X step that's gonna cause my number to grow by five. So here's one step and then we go by five. One, two, three, four, five, and then I'm up here. And so every time I take a step, I grow by five and every time I go backwards, I go down by five. So that's gonna be my line, wonderful. Notice that this line here is almost like I took my picture and I spun it a little bit, so now it's tilted. So I'm gonna have to tilt this one a little bit as well. Well, how, how much am I going up? I'm going up one, two, three, four, five. Okay, uh, and then I, so let, let's do the same thing for this one over here. I'm gonna go over one, two, three, four, and five. And then this one went one step over to the right. This one needs to go one step up that doesn't seem right uh one step down that seems better that seems like it's going to keep that same idea of them being perpendicular okay so what would that slope be that slope that we've just created is five over so it's a run of five and a rise really a drop of negative one okay so my new slope i'll call that m2 is a rise of negative one over a run of five. Whereas my original one, M1, was a rise of five over a run of one. And they're negative reciprocals. I've created a perpendicular line. Isn't that really interesting? Okay, so I've got the slope, no problem. Uh, it passes through three comma negative one. Ooh, it definitely does not. Three comma negative one would be uh, one, two, three comma negative one would be here, I don't think that it passes through that one at all. Let's just relocate it. We're gonna draw an equation of a line that has all of this piece of information. So here we go, here's my new line. Y equals MX, M would be negative one fifth, negative one fifth X plus B. What's my B? I don't know where my B is. I know where this point is. B would be somewhere on this axis. 
Maybe I can't use my slope intercept form of a line. I tried to use y equals mx plus b, but that might not be the best place to try to do this from. What other ones do I have? I have standard form, uh, ax plus by equals c. Uh, that doesn't look like it's gonna help me with either m or anything in there, no points. Um, oh, I have my point slope form, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Oh, let's do that one. Okay, y minus y1, that'd be y minus y1. I need a one, though I got this one right here. That's the point on my new line. So y minus negative one equals m, m is, oh, my new m, my new slope. That's what I'm trying to create a line for, negative one fifth, uh, x minus x1, one of the points. This would be three, I'll put that in there, three. And then I think we could simplify this to see it even more clearly. This would be y plus one, equals negative one fifth x plus three fifths. And then I guess I could get y alone to be y equals uh, negative one fifth x plus three fifths. And I could subtract one from both sides to make that happen. Uh, that would be y equals negative one fifth x uh, plus three fifths. Common denominator would be minus five fifths. And then I could simplify that to be y equals negative one fifth x minus two fifths and i think we've got an equation of a line that was formed from a point it ha has a slope that was perpendicular to my original and i think i've satisfied everything we need here so here are my two perpendicular lines y equals 5x plus 2 this is a, a perpendicular line that passes through the or this is a line that passes through just as we drew it and then i relocated my new one so that it passes through the appropriate point. So I essentially picked it up, put it right here so that it passes through negative two fifths. And I got rid of the original one that I had and I still kept the perpendicularity about it. That's really cool. We're capturing all of these ideas from our explorations, from our, our thoughts. We're modeling and we're creating rules that allow us to talk about geometry without really having to draw the picture at all. Now this is an interesting question. Are these two lines parallel? And if not, do they cross? Where do they cross? Well, it's pretty easy to see they're not parallel. Remember, we already have kind of a process for this. It comes from our understanding of saying that parallel means they have a common direction. Direction in terms of lines on a coordinate plane means slope. And here we have two different slopes, right? And I can tell that because they're both in the standard y equals mx plus b here slope intercept form. So when we're looking here, we can see that this slope is very much y or m equals three. So I'll say the first m, m1, we'll say that that's equal to three, m1 equals three. And you could think of it as three, you could think of it as three to one if you'd like. And the other one, the slope for the second line, I'll call that m2, m2 would be equal to four over one. So that means that for every three steps that you go up for line one, you go over one step, but in the other one, you need to go four steps in order to go over one step. Now, this is not parallel. That means they need to cross. Where do they cross? That's an interesting question. Well, this one becomes, again, where we got to kind of play with the model of logic. And so this is going to sound a little philosophical, but I want you to pay attention and follow along with what I'm saying and why. If two lines cross, then they're going to cross somewhere on the coordinate plane. So here's a line and there's a line, and they're going to cross right here. At this point, what do I know? Um, I know that there's only one point where they cross, because I can't cross a line at more than one point. Um, at least not unless it's a special case. We'll talk about that in a moment. So at this one point, it's going to cross at, at one point, which I think I could talk about as being just X, uh, Y. I could think of it as X, Y. If you wanted to, we'll call it maybe X one comma Y one. Sure. Why not? It's a point that's on the coordinate plane. Let's call it that. So if they cross, they're going to have to cross at one of these places. And this is the same place for both of them. Both of the lines go through this point. So much of this is true. I'm not pulling out any rules. I'm just pulling out common sense. If two lines cross, they must cross somewhere. They must cross once if they are to cross in the way that I've drawn it here. And if they cross once, then that means that there is a shared point, one and only one shared point. What does that mean? Uh, well, let's play around over here in our equations. That means that in the first equation, I have y1 equals 3x1 plus 2. And on the other one, I have uh, y1 is equal to 4x1 
plus 4. In other words, this point represents values, algebraically speaking, numbers that make this statement true. And they make both of the statements true. That's what we originally defined our line to be. Drawing a line means finding all of the points that make a statement like this true. And if it's where both of the lines cross, then both statements have to be true at that point. Well, that's really interesting because what this says is that I have a whole bunch of things that are going to get me a certain height. And I have a whole bunch of other things that are giving me the same height. So my logic says that I can say that all of these are equal. Isn't that kind of interesting? If you don't believe that, then let's take a moment, ignore that, and we'll come back to it. If this still feels a little bit weird, circle it, we'll do a little question mark. But here's what I'm saying. I'm saying all of this stuff gets me y1. So I can say 3x1 plus 2 is the same thing as y1. But y1 is the same thing as all of this stuff. So y1 must be the same stuff as this. So that must mean that if they're all equal, then they're all equal. That means that 3x1 plus 2 has to be equal to 4x1 plus 4. In other words, one of these is a process to get me to this point, and the other one's a process to get me to the same point if there's at a certain x value, a certain x1 here. So at a certain x1, there's a shared height. That's all we've determined. And then we talked about each of the methods we got, had to get there. Well, we could solve this out. Um, I could get rid of 2 on the left by subtracting 2. I could balance that on the right. That would give me 3x1 equals 4x1 plus 2. I could, I could solve by getting all my variables on the same side. Maybe I subtract 4x1 from both sides. That would give me a negative x1 on the left. And on the right-hand side, I'd be left with just 2. I'd get rid of the negative by multiplying both sides by negative 1 or dividing both sides by negative 1. That would give me x1 equals negative 2. And so what that means is that at the x value of negative 2, so obviously my picture here is a little bit wrong, at the x value of negative 2, these two equations, whatever they are, however they draw, are going to have to be the place where they cross. So let's relocate this and we'll give it a little bit more context here. So at this place, somewhere above or below this x equals 1, they're going to cross. That's very interesting. Where is the cross? Where is, where is the cross actually going to happen? Well, if both of these have x1 giving me the commonality that gets their heights the same, it's just the process is different, then let's find each of the processes. On the first one, I've got 3 times x1 would be negative 2 plus 2. That would be 3 times negative 2 gets me negative 6 plus 2. That gets me negative 4. So the first one says I'm going to get, by the time that I'm at this negative 2, I will have taken three steps negatively, where each step is going to be a negative 2, so 3 negative 2 steps away from 2, and that gets me to negative 4. That makes sense. So here we are, negative 4 for my y value. So the first line says it's going to be there, and we could do it for the next one as well. That says that I'm going to take 4 steps, 4 negative 2 steps, and I'm going to go away from 4. Well, that would be negative 8 plus 4, and that would be positive, or negative 8 and negative 4. Oh, there it is. So that's another thing that says both of these are going to be intersecting right here. And in fact, you can see that if we were to graph each of these lines. One said I was going to start up at 2, and every time I go over uh, 1, I go up 3, which means if I go backwards, let's see, 1, 2, 3, I would go over 1. So that'd be here, and then I would go 3 more, and that would get me here. So this is the first line. The second line says that I was starting at, uh, let's see, um, 4x plus, I think I, I copied 4x plus 4 instead of 4x plus 1. Ah, it doesn't matter. We'll make this into 4. There we are. So it's now I'm saying that I'm going to start up here at 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go backwards 4 steps, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to go backwards 4 and then backwards 1 and then backwards 4 and backwards 1. And here's the other line. And sure enough, they both cross at negative 2 comma negative 4. Very interesting. So ignore that typo. We'll just, we'll make that whatever we want it to be. All right, there you are. Plus four. This is all for example. So you can find out where the equations cross by simply recognizing that the y values and the x values are the same there. So you can substitute one for the other. You can plug things in. You can move things around all you want. In fact, that's another interesting example. I could have just started right here and I could have solved for x's and I could have taken my x values and put them in over here because that'd be an x value where it was shared for the other equation and the first equation. So that's what it means to have two lines cross, is it means that there's actually a solution that works for both of them. And if that's the case, then you get a lot of opportunity to be able to equate and to kind of bridge these two different expressions at that one given point. Now that's kind of interesting. All right, are these two lines parallel? Let's look here. 
Uh, easy way to do this. We could absolutely make this into slope intercept form. Y equals three X plus two. You could divide the other one by two. That gets you Y equals three X plus two. Yes, they are parallel. They have the same slope. In fact, they're the exact same line, aren't they? Aren't they all the solutions that would work for here would work for here? Cause really it's the same thing. Okay, so let's talk through that one. What would happen if I was gonna draw that on a coordinate plane? That would be where I drew one line, which says that I start at two and then I go up three and over one. So something like this. And the other one would say I do that exact same thing again. So I'll do it in pink just to keep it separate. I go up three over one and it's again, the exact same line on top of itself. Now, what if I wanted to know how many times these lines crossed? Do they cross once? Do they cross twice? More than twice? Many places? Well, just by the picture, I can see that they cross everywhere. Every point that you grab on one of these lines is also a point on the other line. Obviously, it's the exact same thing. How would that look if we, I don't know, maybe get tricked and started playing with the equation? Let's imagine we hadn't done the simplifying. So let's imagine that maybe we were overly ambitious, we forgot to, to make them look similar, and I just wanted to try doing the same thing I did above, which is where I plug something in and I look at the effects of that. Because if I plug one in, I substitute something into the other, I should be able to find the X values and Y values for where they cross. Does it work? Do I get different information if I do that and they don't cross or they cross all the time? Okay, well, let's try this. Um, I could take all of this because this says Y is equal to all of this stuff. And if I'm claiming they cross, that means that I have a Y value and an X value that work for both. So I'm going to claim that if all of this is Y, I can put it in over here where that says Y. Because at one point, that's going to be true. So that'd be two times, and then I'd put in everything that I have Y equal to. So instead of Y, I'm putting things that are equal to Y. Three X plus two equals six X plus four. So again, I haven't changed the meaning. I've just changed my perspective. Instead of looking at it as two lines, I'm looking at it as a point on those two lines. And at the point on those two lines, that's a place where Y values in both equations mean the exact same thing. And X values in both equations mean the exact same thing. So I can replace them all. I can change the perspective, not change the meaning. All right, let's simplify this up and see. Well, that's two uh, times three gets me six X. And then two times four gets me two. And that would obviously be equal to six X plus four. Uh, what X for what X values is this true? Well, any X value, isn't that, isn't that the case? If any X value, any X value you give me, isn't this statement can be true that something is equal to itself. So all of these X values are saying that all of these are X values where if I plugged one in, I would get the same Y values in either this equation or this equation. And that makes perfect sense. If we're talking about the exact same line. In fact, we could even simplify this up more and we get to some weird looking things. If I subtract four from both sides and subtract four from both sides, six X equals six X, which means that uh, I could divide both sides by six. That would give me X equals X. Uh, and then I could say, when does X equal X? I can maybe divide both sides by X. And that would say, um, let's see, one equals one. Is that true? Is X equal to X? Is six X equal to six X? Is this equation equal to itself? Is one equal to one? Yes. How often? Always. How does X change this? It doesn't. X doesn't change one being equal to one. That is a truth. Six X being equal to six X. That's a truth. This whole thing being equal to this whole thing. It's a truth. So these equations are the same thing. It's a truth. They're the exact same thing. It doesn't depend on X. It's not a specific value that pops out. Now there's one last example I want to show you and we might have to, we might have to create it. Let's see. Okay. So here's the one that I want to play with. And this is one that just came to mind. What about lines that don't cross? So let's think about two lines that don't cross. Uh, I'll come up with one at the top of my head. Y equals uh, three or two thirds X plus eight. And I'll do another one. Y equals uh, four six X plus seven. How do I know these don't cross? Well, I just hid that here is the same slope as the other one. This is really just two thirds X plus seven. They're not going to cross. What if I didn't want to bother drawing a picture and I just wanted to see where they cross? Let's see what happens. Well, again, assumption. Assumption is that if they cross, there's a Y value that is shared and an X value that's shared. And I'm just trying to figure out what that is. Well, let's try that out. Let's assume that they were. So I'm going to be able to set them equal. Two thirds X plus eight gets me to the same Y value as two thirds X plus seven. In other words, two thirds X plus eight is equal to two thirds X plus seven. So I could actually get rid of that middle stuff right there. All right, let's simplify it up. 
I have 2 thirds x on both sides. I could subtract 2 thirds x. That's going to get me 8 equal to 7. Is that true? Absolutely not. So notice what happened. We made an assumption. We said, let's run forward and assume this thing is true. And we did, and we got to something that was illogical. So if we say, let's assume that something is true and it's going to give us this result, and then we do it and it does not get us that result, we must have started from a place that wasn't logical. Because if you start from a place that's logical and you do nothing but logic since then, we believe that we would end to a, to a place that is logical. Here, we started from a place that was logical, we got to a place that was illogical, that must have meant that we either made a mistake in the middle, which I don't think we did, or we started from a bad assumption, and it was actually wrong to begin with. So this is a good way for you to be able to figure out just algebraically, no paper, whether or not two lines are parallel. If you substitute one into the other, or the other into the first, and you get something that is illogical, then that must mean that they don't cross. There isn't a y value or x value that makes that true. If you substitute one into the other and you get something that is always true, then you must have started with an assumption that is always true. If you substitute one into the other and you get a, a, an answer that is true only at a certain point, then that must mean that your original assumption is true only at a certain point. Kind of interesting. Now the rest of this is just a little bit of a fun exercise that I want to show everybody. So we had this claim that I made in the beginning. Take any four points, and if you connect the middles, you are guaranteed to get a parallelogram. Well, this is a fun one, so I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker, but I'm going to show you what we can do. Let's create four points, and you're going to notice that all that I'm doing right here is I'm just playing with the things we have, and I'm just using them in a creative way. Let's take four points. Here's how I'm going to call them. I'm going to call them point one, point two, point three and point four. All right, point one, can I be more specific? No problem, it has an X one and it has a Y one. What about point two? It has a X two and it has a Y two. And I could do this for each and every one. And I can do it for the last one as well. All right, um, any particular order? No, I started with these. You could think of it as being, this is point one, this is being point two, this is being point three, and this is being point four. But since I put no numbers on this, really you have no idea if I'm thinking of this picture or if I'm thinking of this picture, or if I'm thinking of another picture, or if I'm thinking of a picture that, that you're thinking of. In fact, this is the power of algebra. I started from an idea of seeing, but now I'm going beyond seeing and guessing into knowing and showing. I'm going to show you for certain, and then we will know it together. All right, so what are the things I did next? I connected the two points into a line, right? And I got a direction for those lines. Uh, I, got a, I connected these two into a line, and then I found the halfway point. Do you remember doing that? We have an equation for the halfway mark between lines. Do you remember what it is? So now, here we go, we're gonna call these the halfway marks, the, the what, midpoints, so I'll label them accordingly. Um, let's use, oh, we already used P a whole bunch. I don't wanna use M, because that usually means slope. What do we want to use? Midpoint, um, middle, uh, do you want to call it the letter D? Um, no, let's call it H. Let's call it H for halfway. All right, we'll call it whatever one. So here we go. H1, this is going to be the halfway between P1 and P2, the halfway point. It's right here. How do we do that? Um, H1 is normally uh, found by doing the middle distance between the two. That would be X1 plus X2 over 2 and then uh, y1 plus y2 over two. You might remember this as your midpoint formula, but I'm remembering it as the halfway mark between two points. All right, and then I've got h2 would be the same thing, h3 would be the same thing, so I'm gonna do that for all these. All right, x1 plus x2 over two, y1 plus y2 over two. And why are we doing all this? Because again, we're just playing. Maybe I told you what the, the result is gonna look like, or at least what, I, what I'm pretty sure it's gonna look like. But how do people find this out? Because we play, because we have tools in our belt and there's no reason why we can't play. And when we do, we stumble across amazing things that never would have been apparent if we hadn't played before. Now, I made a claim that these were a parallelogram. Parallelograms mean that this face is in the same direction, meaning if I connected H4 and H1 and got a slope from that, a direction from that, it would have to be the same as connecting H3 and H2 together, getting a direction from those two. Is that true? All right, well, let's let's keep playing. How would I find the slope between H4 and H1? Uh, maybe I'll call that the M, the M between four and one. So I'll call that M uh, four one. There you go. 
how do I do that? Slope is change in y. Okay, well, here is my four to one. The change in my y's would be the change between these y coordinates. Okay, that's a lot of stuff, but we'll keep track. Y four plus y one over two was my first y coordinate. It came from right here, and I'm going to subtract it from this one right here. That would be minus uh, y one plus y two over two. And that would be the f my change in y is over my change in x's. My change in x's would be x4 plus x1 over 2 minus x1 plus x2 over 2. That would be the slope between 1 and 4. My midpoint, my first midpoint, and my second midpoint, or my first halfway point, my second halfway point. Well, that's crazy complicated. Let's simplify that on up. Um, notice that the twos are bothering me on the top and bottom. Here's a creative solution. Let's multiply the entire numerator by two, and I'll balance that by doing the entire denominator by two. And then I would d do it to everything and distribute one of the properties we're aware of. I could distribute here and here, and then distribute here and here. That gets rid of all of those twos, and I'm left with uh, y to the four, or y four plus y one minus uh, everything in the second parenthesis, it'd be minus y1 and then minus y2, and then all of that would be over x4 plus x1 minus x1 minus x2. Well, that I can simplify even more. I can simplify that by looking here, and I have a y1 minus a y1. There's no need for that. That's just y4 minus y2 on the top. That's the only information that's important, and on the bottom, I've just got x4 minus x2. Okay, so here we are. This is the first slope between my midpoints. This is the slope that's either between these two midpoints or these two midpoints. It's all variables. It doesn't matter. You have no way of knowing what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all of them at the same time. All right. The missing link is, is that in fact the same between those two? So let's do the exact same thing again. Don't worry, it goes faster this time. So now we're looking for the midpoint between three and two, or the, the slope between midpoint three and midpoint two. All right, I'll call that three, two. What do I have there? Um, I have the difference in y's, that'd be y3 plus y4 over two minus y2 plus y3 over two divided by the difference in x's. The change in x is my run. I've got my rise that I just did and I'm doing my run now. My run would be the same thing with x's, x3 plus x4 over two minus x2 plus x3 over two uh, we know that everything here could just be simplified by multiplying by two on the top and bottom, same as above. We also know that we're going to simplify some things. Um, let's see how that's all gonna flow out. So I could rewrite this as y3 plus y4 minus y2 minus y3 over x3 plus x4 minus x2 minus x3. This and this are opposite. Those can cancel away. I'm left with y4 minus y2 over x4 minus x2. And notice that they're the exact same. So now let's go back up the train and recontextualize. What I have found is that the slope between my first and fourth midpoints is going to be the same as my slope between my third and second midpoints because I've got the same equations. I've literally got the same things here and here. And where are my first and fourth midpoints and my third and second midpoints? They're opposite of each other, right here and right here. And the truth is, if you do the exact same thing, looking at the slope between the midpoints H3 and H4 compared to H2 and H1, it's the same thing. These are all the same. They're parallelograms. And in fact, you can use this process to be able to improve, to prove some amazing things that, that take ge uh, geometricians like, like pages of work to do. You can prove that if you draw a square and you cut the square uh, w with, with connecting the opposite corners, that you're always going to get a perpendicular in the middle. You can do that with the same thing that we've learned in this lesson. You can prove that if you're, if you're playing around with, with a kite shape or a rhombus, that that's going to be the same thing where you get a perpendicular in the middle. And you can do the same thing just by playing around with symbols on the paper, moving these X's, these Y's around. And now you don't even have to talk about a specific picture. I've got every picture in my mind. I've done this for everything you could possibly ever do. And I didn't even have to know what you drew on your notepad when we started this lesson. Now that's the power of algebra.